pleased to be moderating uh, this session. There we go. Uh, uh, we have three uh, very interesting papers to hear from today. Uh, so um, for our first two presenters, uh, being shorter papers, uh, you'll have about uh, 15 to 20 minutes or so for presentation, and then we'll have some time afterward for questions. Our third presentation, being a long paper, we'll have additional time for presentation, uh, but same thing, we'll take some time for questions uh, after the presentation is done. Uh, so presenters, I will be monitoring the chat during your presentation. Uh, I'll keep track of all the questions that have come up and I'll catch you up on those at the end of your presentation. We'll also open the floor to participants for additional questions at that time as well. Um, so I see all of our presenters are here. I think we're good to go ahead and get going. Our first presentation is a uh, pre-recorded one. I'm going to go ahead and give a brief introduction and then we will get that queued up. Our first paper is uh, China, Art in the Museums Overseas, Metadata Aggregation of Chinese Digital Collection Images. Uh, our presenter is uh, Shilong Ho an associate professor at uh, School of Communication in Chifu Normal University. Uh, he finished his postdoctoral at School of Information Resources, Wuhan University, and received his PhD of management from Central China Normal University. Uh, Dr. Ho's research interests include knowledge organization systems, linked data, digital humanities, and cultural heritage. Uh, we are going to get that uh, presentation queued up for you now. Uh, okay, thanks for your introduction. Uh, first, I will share my screen. I don't believe we have any audio coming through. Is that? Can you see my screen? Uh, so we can see the screen. I'm not getting any audio though. Uh, when you go to share the screen, there might be an option to share sound as well. So you might need to unshare your screen and reshare and make sure you're enabling sound to share as well. Okay, okay. Should I play the video? You can answer the questions by yourself. I'll play the video from here. Is that okay? Uh, I must agree. Okay. Okay, fine. Thank you. I'll play in, in a second. No. So we're still not uh, getting audio. Uh, let's go ahead and have uh, Nishad okay. play the presentation uh, uh, from his machine. Hi, everyone. I'm Hu Xilong, working for Chufu Normal University at the Center for Digital Humanities, Wuhan University. Today, I will introduce our research and practice about the metadata aggregation of Chinese digital collections from overseas lamps. We call the project China Art in the Museum Overseas. The presentation will are talking about uh, the main process and methods of this project. Firstly, I will introduce the background of this project. Secondly, the workflow of metadata aggregation. And then, so the functions of this platform. Finally, summarizing the findings and the conclusions from this project. As we all know, with the application of digital technologies, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums publish the digital collections on the web. During this process, linked open data, knowledge graph, triple RF, Fair principles are widely used by the GLABS. 
as more and more institutions bring their data to the semantic web, making it possible to aggregate dispersed data from different institutions. Currently, there are lots of data aggregation projects and practice. Europeana is the best known example. Metadata schemas, conceptual models such as CDOC, CRM, EDM, LRM are applied at different levels. But due to the diversity of types and metadata schemas of digital objects, making it difficult to aggregate cultural heritage data. We aim to aggregate digital collections related to Chinese culture published by overseas clubs, integrate, reorganize, and semantically enrich those heterogeneous digital resources, providing standard and reusable linked open data, construct smart data of Chinese cultural heritage, supporting protection and dissemination of traditional culture. This slide shows the data aggregation workflow. Firstly, we design the unified data model dealing with the data heterogeneity. Secondly, harvesting, mapping, and transforming the data into RDF data format. Then, enrich and interlink the data with linked open data datasets. The website was established on the RDF database, providing data access and service interface. The data model primarily uses schema.org vocabulary. The data model describes digital objects from three aspects, including basic information, data access information, and data source information. The data model's properties are extracted and aligned the common metadata elements from different institutions. Semantic enrichment is an effective strategy to improve the data value through semantic technology and was applied as a main strategy to construct smart data in GLAMS. As for the structured or semi-structured data, data providers' metadata are enriched by linking the data value with QoS vocabularies or external datasets. For example, the type of digital collection is enriched with values from classification of national collections of cultural relics. The person names and concepts are enriched with values from AAT, Wikidata, DBpedia, and other vocabularies. As for unstructured and textual data, we use NLP and entity recognition to extract person names, police names, or other entities, uh, then link them to domain knowledge base in order to get more context and information for cultural heritage objects. For the enrichment of digital images, the machine learning technology, such as object detection, crowdsourcing, deep semantic annotation was used to annotate the image content and label them semi-automatically. Semantic enrichment is increasingly used during recent years, directly applied to the enhancement of GLAM state. Based on the work above, the platform was built for aggregating and searching Chinese digital collections. The main features of the platform as follows, including search and browse, semantic annotation, and digital storytelling. The platform implements RIF APIs and publishing linked data following FAIR principles. The platform can help the users easily access those integrated digital collections. Currently, the platform aggregated about 10 institutions 
and 20 stolen images from Harvard Art Museum's European Metropolitan Museum of Art. The detailed web page shows the enriched metadata from the data providers and some related items. Bottom left of the page is hyperlinks for RDF browser, data source web page, IIIF viewers, and the semantic annotation for this image. The aggregated metadata was enriched and published as linked open data so the clients can query and access the data via Sparkle endpoint. We use Snorkel to explore, retrieve, and browse RDF triples. The platform also applies Antodia to visualize, navigate, and explore linked data. Semantic linkages are established by agent, event, time, subject, keywords, uh, or other relationships. RF has been widely used by GLAMS and, and identified as efficient and low technical barriers solutions for metadata aggregation in the domain of cultural heritage. Our platform supports RF APIs. It provides RF services for image sharing, annotation, and management. It can generate RF manifest for digital storytelling and digital creations so that those digital collections can be reused to make more creative works. We proposed a solution to resolve the problems of metadata heterogeneity and data aggregation. And we found that semantic enrichment is one major step to maximize GLAM's discoverability, reusability, and their value. Fair principles should be adapted for cultural heritage collections to enable digital resources become more fair. Our project and practice will promote the protection and dissemination of Chinese cultural heritage. Future work includes expanding collaboration on continue to enrich the metadata and optimizing the data model for metadata mapping, increasing searching accuracy of the platform. Thanks for your attention. More information about the project, please visit our DH Center's website or email us. Thanks. Thank you uh, for that presentation. Um, let's move on and hear from our second presenter. Thank you again, uh, Shilong. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Jing Zhou, uh, a doctoral student in School of Information Management, Wuhan University, China. Her research interests include knowledge organization, knowledge management, semantic web, uh, and digital humanities. She participates in research projects on metadata, evaluation of uh, collections, database construction, information retrieval, and research data management, and is the author of several publications. Uh, Jing, thank you so much for joining us and uh, sharing your work with us today. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. Uh, could you or hear me clearly? Uh, yes. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, okay, uh, can you see my screen now? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, uh, my name is Jin Zhou. I'm a PhD student in the School of Information Management, Wuhan University. And uh, I'm very honored to give you a speech uh, about my research, uh, the great site ontology design from the perspective of protection and utilization. Uh, and here comes my first question. Uh, what are great sites? They are large sites and their cultural landscapes that reflect the political, religious, industrial, 
agricultural, historical, and cultural information at the various stages of development in ancient Chinese history. Its scale far exceeds other immovable cultural relics in China. As we can see in this picture, many historical architecture are like Daoming Palace in Xi'an city, which coexist with modern buildings in the, in the city. That's to say, in the process of rapid urbanization in China, the protection and utilization of great sites are facing unprecedented pressure. And the protection and utilization of great sites have gone through three stages in China. Passive protection uh, at first, and then exploration for utilization. And at present, promoting protection by utilization. During these processes, a wealth of knowledge has been dis uh, produced, uh, such as people, organizations, time, places, events, and regulations about the great sites. Um, for example, uh, will we see, uh, will we look at the picture of Qin Shi Huang Terracotta Army, we may have several questions. Who are they? Where are they displayed? And when are they excavated? Um, and uh, what has been done to ensure both urbanization and the safety of it? But the knowledge behind the great sites is really excavated and expressed. So what fields of knowledge should we focus on to describe the protect, protection and utilization of activities of these great sites? And how to make full use of the knowledge and give full play to its cultural and social value? Many previous researches have shown that knowledge organization methods, especially ontology, can promote knowledge modeling and representation. So I built up a great site ontology. Uh, firstly, I define the top level ontology. Uh, as we all know, uh, users should be considered in ontology development. So we conduct the user interviews to figure out their, uh, their knowledge needs of great sites. The interviewees are most concerned about the basic information. Mm. Uh, environmental, historical, and cultural backgrounds of great sites. They also pay attention to their historical evolution in different life cycles of great sites. And the interviewees generally believe that um, the elements of a great site include relics, remains, natural environment, and the cultural landscape. Staff, curators, and the practitioners of museums and the cultural, uh, cultural relics departments pay more attention to the excavation, protection, management, utilization, and the research activities of three sites. And according to the results of my interview, I reviewed two formal ontologies, the Doc CRM and Time Ontology. Besides, I customized six uh, classes according to my actual needs, great sites, historical ev event, historical actor, protection and utilization activity, information resource and environment to build up the top level ontology. And secondly, I extract a knowledge concept. On the one hand, I use the top down approach. I collect a dictionary and thesaurus and then uh, consult some experts to determine the main structure of knowledge concept. On the other hand, I use the bottom-up approach. I collect a wealth of knowledge concepts and instances of great size by building corpus, uh, word segmentation, and entity recognition. And here is the classes and uh, data properties. Uh, on the left, um, I list 
the 11 main classes of the ontology and I divide some of them into subclasses. Uh, for example, I divide uh, protection and the utilization activity into site protection, utilization, measurement, and research. And I divide environment class into natural, cultural, economic, political, and technological environment. And I customize uh, their properties, trying to describe the relationship between urban development and grid sites. Besides, I reuse uh, some metadata sets and ontology, such as the DC metadata, the friends of a friend vocabulary, Shanghai Library Names Authority ontology, geo names, VRA code. And uh, here are the object properties. I divide the, uh, the main two four types. The inheritance relation, uh, spatial temporal relation, subordinate relation, and action relation. And here is the whole um, model of the ontology. Uh, I list the 11 classes and their uh, subclasses and part of the relation. At last, I use this ontology to describe uh, the Han, Han Chang'an city site in Xi'an area. Mm. Uh, we can start from the Han Chang'an city site, and it has remains named Weiyang Palace, and it has an event named the construction of Weiyang Palace. Uh, it was produced by Xiao He, uh, who has a specialty, Xiang Guo Xiao, uh, who is a famous character in ancient Chinese history. And please look at the uh, right. Uh, the Han Chang'an city site is described by a book named the Han Chang'an City, and it has two uh, creators, Liu Qingzhu and Li Yufang. Mm, Liu Qingzhu is, is also Li Yufang's spouse, and the Li Yufang uh, and the Qing Erpang Palace site is also fixed by Li, Yu, Li Yufang. And according to my further research, uh, we will further visualize the ontology in footage, and with the help of the good conceptual hierarchy and the logical reasons reasoning function of the ontology, we can implement semantic retrieval and reasoning in order to obtain the explicit and implicit knowledge of the grid site. And at last, the granularity of knowledge organization needs to be further refined. We will scan data uh, sources and data research objects and realize a wider range of online retrieval with external vocabulary. And that's the end of my sharing. Thanks for watching. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Um, but for now, I think we'll move on to our third speaker. Thank you again very much, uh, Jing, okay. for your presentation. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. So we'll go ahead and uh, switch over. Our third presenter, uh, Nishad Talhat, is a doctoral student in information studies at Tsukuba University, Japan, specializing in metadata standards, knowledge graphs, and data interoperability. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to present the paper in Dublin Core. It's my second time to present uh, in Dublin Core Conference. <clears throat> so I'd like to present some continuation of my previous uh, paper and project uh, explained in the previous Dublin Core Conference in 2019. So this time uh, the title is Application Profile Driven Data Acquisition for Knowledge Graph and Link Data Generation in Crowdsource Data Journalism. So um, what I tried to do is to approach uh, social informatics and other crowdsourcing uh, 
data collection uh, requirements and evaluate how we can bring some application profile concepts to it. So what is data journalism? Because it's a technique, it's a kind of a confusing thing, but uh, it, in simple way, according to the, according to the gatebook of data journalism, the data journalism handbook, uh, the definition is that uh, data can be either the tool used to tell a story or the source upon which a story is based or both. And data journalism is an upshot to big data, which aims to find uh, exploitable patterns in social or public data. And the moment you think about social and public data, it opens a lot of different scopes. For example, now we have big knowledge graphs like Wikidata, and uh, we have uh, geospatial information comes from OpenStreetMap and a lot of other social informatics data. So data journalism has a biggest future and possibility when it tries to connect its effort to link open data and another other public knowledge graphs or open knowledge graphs. So data journalism has this golden seven C's or they call it the golden standards or seven C's, which is a seven, which are seven challenges or uh, capacities of data journalism. So they are complexity, collection, collaboration, crowdsourcing, co-creation, competencies, and combination. Uh, if you look closer, you can see that, uh, first of all, one of the data acquisition concept is crowdsourcing, which uh, is one of the major C's and major, major interest for us that uh, how we can approach crowdsourcing, crowdsource data in more, more, more uh, systematic way, which will help us to create more linked open data or knowledge graph. Uh, among all these seven C's, you can see that crowdsourcing, combination, collection, and uh, complexity directly related to the scope of linked open data or knowledge graphs. And potentially we find that there is a scope for us to apply some of our investigations and findings about application profiles and try to make some progress in there. So if you see a data journalism project, it's not like any other data collection or study process because in a data journalism, uh, the framework of data journalism uh, includes different facets of data collection, um, different facets that includes different aspect of data interaction. For example, data journalism projects uh, mainly depends on public data. Then some of the projects has a project data set, which exclusively created or organized for that specific project. Then stakeholders contribute data. So multiple stakeholders can be involved on a project and they can actually contribute uh, data to the framework. Then the topmost and important aspect is crowdsourced data, which requires a crowd or general public interaction. And uh, we can collect a lot of information, which otherwise not possible to X, I mean, acquire. Then uh, data journalism has this journalistic process. So they try to infer uh, some of the information, some of the aspects of this data and try to produce many publications that includes uh, not only just news articles or journal articles, but interactive visualization, data insight, and other projects which explore the possibility of data. But along with that, we can see that some of this or mo most of these data journalism projects uh, give back data or share data and uh, they have public data access. So many projects uh, give their data along with the publication. And there is a potential scope that how we can connect some of this output to LOD or linked open data sets or other public knowledge graphs. And uh, that's one of the uh, uh, one of the major uh, aspects where we have to investigate what is the possibility for semantic web to get more benefit, get more benefits from data journalistic projects. So some of the aims and goals is how a simplified application profile can be created for data journalism projects. And just want to demonstrate some possibilities of adopting uh, uh, and acquiring disseminating data in some of these case studies. Then I would like to show some practical insights on uh, reliable and reasonable metadata application profile and vocabulary development for data journalism project. 
with the notion to improve the quality and quantity of linkable data which we could obtain from all these projects. Uh, so, uh, resource description framework or RDF, which actually the core of linked data is emerging as a universal data model and a semantic web is getting really popular and uh, it, it can consume uh, linked data and knowledge graph together. For example, many projects can actually connect back to Wikidata and other projects using uh, links. And also we can create uh, knowledge graphs, which is inter interconnected graphs, which can uh, give more insight into data than just numerically approaching data. Then sharing the profile with the data, especially actionable formats, will help the data stakeholders ensure the structure uh, and quality of the data by validating it. So uh, two main objects uh, which we try to address is how we can produce more idea from a data journalistic process and how we can share or create actionable profiles, which helps people to validate and uh, improve, I mean, we can quality control the data which they produce. Uh, to give an overview, uh, we have this open data and uh, the level of openness is defined like five star, uh, that's a, a link data level. So the one star is, it's, it can be on the web with an open license. So mostly, most of the open uh, available free or open or free licensed data or open licensed data available in the web are one star data. But when they're machine readable, for example, not scanned documents or not PDFs, but more data formats, which is machine readable, then it's two star. Then if they publish in a non-proprietary format, for example, CSV or any other non-proprietary format, which doesn't require a specific software or tools to interact, then probably it is a three-star data. Then four-star is mainly, mainly if you publish your data in RDF, it is four-star and the fifth star is for uh, making that RDF link to other concepts. So, uh, our approach is how we can move forward uh, to considering some of the aspects of application profiles in linked data generation or RDF generation, at least four and five star of data, how we can do that easily or simplified way. So there is this classical definition of application profile. This is from 2000, is by Hedy and Patel, and they define that application profile consists of data elements drawn from one or more namespace schemas combined together by implementers and optimized for a particular local application. So the confusing part of this team application profile, the application comes from this definition that what is your local application of these schemas? How you locally customize for your, your application of your data and application of your uh, localized requirement, then uh, you can call that the profile of that data or an application profile of that data. Uh, to illustrate it in a more simplified way, for example, you have a metadata instance, then if you need to make that data instance explained in a perfect way, you may need to borrow terms from different namespaces. Say, for example, sometimes you need to borrow terms from DC terms and schema or many other vocabularies. So uh, nowadays, we, we, if we need to clearly explain some, some instances, then we need to borrow, for, borrow or mix and match from multiple uh, namespaces or schemas, then make our own local application of that, uh, that, you, that uh, terms. So basically it describes a set of, set of metadata elements, policies, guidelines, and vocabularies, and explain how it has been implemented in this local instance then declares the metadata terms, information resource, application, and all its use. Then finally, it documents metadata standard used, including schemas, vocabularies, policies, etc. So just to summarize it, the simplest way to say a modern uh, new world application profile is it consists of metadata schema, then the semantics of the schema that, for example, if you borrow the term uh, DC term title, then what is your local application of that term in, in your uh, instant, then you, you have to explain some of that semantics. Then of course, it's a set of some set of data validation tool, then basic documentation, for example, human readable notes and instructions to fill this uh, or validate this 
includes the documentation part of it. So in short, we can say that an application profile consists of metadata schema, semantics, validation, and documentation. So basically it is a more of an explainer and a constrainer of, of this local data. So how we try to bridge this gap is we try to put a, a application profile for data acquisition aspect, as we explained before that meta, uh, crowd, crowdsourcing is a mode of data acquisition, which is really, really implemented in all data journalistic process. So how can we Im 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 implement some sort of application profile in this data acquisition so that we can consume or disseminate data uh, based on this profile and which can be four or five star uh, open data. So in the paper, we used a really simplified example, but in real world, this is a really complex scenario to look into a questionnaire. So we picked up a simple questionnaire to show it easily. Uh, we, this is a simple questionnaire which tried to collect some information about uh, an incident or a, or a, pro, or a uh, protest happened in a different countries or different part of the world. So it was this questionnaire is supposed to be circulated among and just collect this data back. So as we can see that this is a conventional model, but uh, uh, when we consider uh, how we convert this into a profile, and that's the most uh, most uh, complex problem for most of these people because an application profile requires some sort of skills and um, tooling and, and much more effort with minimal incentive. So what we try to do is do the profile or derive the profile before we collect the data along with the questionnaire. That's what the, would be proposed in the paper. So when we look into a, an application profile, this model borrows, uh, borrow, is borrowed from Dublin Core Tabular Application Profile or DC Tab Cancer. So in DC Tab, we define an entity and an entity is whole, is entity or shape has more statements in it. And the statements can be either a B node or an IRI or a literal. So B node and IRI are non-literals and a literal is a literal value and it just has a value. But uh, in this setup model, we can see that a B node and IRI can be uh, linked to another entity uh, or it can be another entity. So this complex modeling can go as long as you have, uh, you have a really complex questionnaire. Uh, in our example, we use only one entity, but uh, entities can be linked together if you have a really complex questionnaire. And uh, uh, that, that makes the whole profile a little bit complex, but for the convenience, let's say, take our old example. Uh, we simply define that this is an idea of type of a protest, and we try to find an equivalent concept from Wikidata uh, to make the profile. Uh, complete so that we say that this is an instant of an entity in Wikidata, which is actually an instant of a specific protest. Then we try to map uh, the country, which is actually a known value. So there is always a list of countries from Wikidata, which we can easily map to this country uh, pr property. Then city is mapped to schema.org city, then again date is schema.org date. So we can say that this simple profile is uh, built from RDF namespace and uh, to declare the RDF. Uh, then we use uh, uh, this whole properties from schema, this three properties. Then we try to map the country to Wikidata using Wikidata qualified identifiers or URIs. So the general approach is uh, that you design a questionnaire then you try to create a profile for the questionnaire. Then use some sort of tools uh, to produce action, I mean actionable uh, format of the prof profile. Or uh, in an alternative way, if you don't have a sophisticated tooling for the profile, you can use uh, uh, some uh, interactive tools like OpenRefine to do it interactively. But uh, in our approach, we are not uh, going th through that way, but that's generally comparably easy. And many, many uh, literature is available how OpenRefine can be included in this process. But our approach is more on application profile. So we have the profile then we try to process that data based on the actionable profile. Then we try to map the values to IRIs. Uh, 
then or a reconciliation service if you use uh, open refine or anything that you can that is capable to do reconciliation uh, to iris then finally try to produce the rdf this is the model we propose in the paper uh, and to um, implement this basic proposal what we try to do is uh, uh, we try to uh, code, code or, or explain an application profile or form uh, or model that's the best way uh, uh, the model our application profile we used a doubler application profile format or dctap so dctap is fairly simple and uh, there is a workshop coming for deep dc tablet application profile so uh, dc tab is the most easiest way to represent an application profile in a tabular format so in in our example we can say that uh, we borrowed properties from schema uh, then we 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 kind of give some labels which is actually the documentation or human treatable documentation part of it so we say that every property has certain label, uh, which is useful for humans to understand as a documentation. Then we made some constraints that whether they are mandatory or repeatable, this is for the validation aspect. Then we declare some node type, which is actually the whole core of this uh, idea of mapping. Then we build uh, some value constraint to constrain these values within our expected RDF. Uh, then uh, another approach is Yama, which also we we presented in 2019 Dublin Gold Conference that uh, how to express an application profile in YAML. So uh, Yama is or Yama stands for yet another metadata application profile, which stands for uh, uh, a simple way to express an application profile in a YAML format. Uh, then DC tab is a tabular format and YAMA is a YAML format, uh, which actually stands as an app authoring format of uh, metadata application profiles. So what we try to do is we try to create the application profile using YAMA and uh, first we created DC tab application profile, then we devised some tooling uh, to make YAMA out of DC tab or, or even uh, extend uh, DC tab with YAMA. Then uh, the result we present is a simple RDF publishing tool and mechanism. The code is open source and which is available free for anyone. Uh, the most important aspect of our RDF publishing mechanism is it's a serverless interface so that you can query the RDF within the browser. So when you convert the RDF, uh, which is already four star and we try to add more links to it where we try, but at least we ensure that it's a four-star data or RDF data. The problem with RDF is you need an RDF store uh, to store that data. Then you need an RDF interface to communicate with that store and to query that data, which makes it really complex at, at many, many occasions. So what we try to do is we try to build a tool uh, which publishes RDF data without an RDF store, or basically which uses an in-browser uh, RDF store to query your data. Uh, and that is what one of the output of our paper, which is, uh, um, which is open source and uh, available uh, for anyone to experiment. Then the second aspect is uh, MRML uh, or application uh, EMA has an application profile format and an RDF mapping utility, as well as a validation schema generator. So EMA can generate RDF from an application profile. So if you give uh, the collected, uh, the crowdsourced CSV data and the profile to EMA, EMA will generate RDF. And along with that RDF, it can also generate a validation schema that is uh, uh, checks right now and uh, uh, which can use to validate the generated RDF. So we try to satisfy two of our main goals that first to produce RDF, then second, uh, try to produce actionable profiles, then try to make the data completely validable, mean, val mean completely uh, actionable by validating and ensuring the quality of the data. So uh, this is also open source and published and free to download and use. Uh, uh, this is also uh, one of the output, output we came up with the investigation. So to conclude this, uh, the expectations is uh, application profiles can improve the semantic interoperability of data they represent. 
So basically, instead of just being CSV or uh, any other data which doesn't explain what it is, uh, a profile will always give more semantic interoperability to data. And in our experiments, what we see that the profile can improve uh, the openness of data along with uh, being along with along with the documentation and validation of uh, the data. Then other expectation is uh, simplified tooling encourages and helps data publishers to publish their data in RDF, uh, which improves the openness of data. So uh, we try to create simple tooling and uh, in the coming uh, days, we will be working more on providing more, most, more usable tools for data acquisition process that including crowdsourcing uh, and specifically for crowdsourcing and how to generate, automatically generate application profiles from uh, questionnaire forms. Uh, and that's those, th those are the things right now we are working on. And thank you for uh, listening to our, to this and uh, 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 all, all tools and codes are available freely, open source and published in GitHub. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, presentation, Nishad. And I must say a very great overview of application profiles and application profile development. Um, all right. Uh, so thank you again, uh, uh, Shilong, Jing, and Nishad. Uh, wonderful presentations, really interesting work going on. I'm looking forward to seeing how all of these uh, develop in the future. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, end this session. I think that there's a break, and then the next sessions start at 15 minutes past the hour. So we've got a little extra time. Uh, uh, grab lunch, breakfast, or dinner, depending on your time zone that you have in. <laughs> and we'll see you back here in just a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Thank, Thank you for sharing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.